Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here um, and inscribed in our uh, Threatened Species Initiative online open course, Conservation Genomics for Threatened Species Management. So I'll be presenting module 9.6, an end-to-end -end case study where we really tried to translate some of this genomics information into conservation management, whether that be on the ground or in the water. Um, and I'm presenting today from Mindaroo Foundation and my name is Dr. Kate Quigley. So um, reef decline has really become quite a global problem since the advent of these repeated mass bleaching events. And uh, bleaching events on coral reefs are really exacerbated by increases in sea surface temperature. So what we can see here is sea surface temperatures from 1961 on the Great Barrier Reef on the east coast of Australia. And we can see that on average year to year, we're starting to get more and more years exceeding um, this 0.5 or one degree threshold. And corals uh, are very complex animals and they actually live very close to their thermal thresholds already. And so when we start to see water temperatures increase and importantly stay high for too long, we start to get coral bleaching. So that's where the coral animal becomes very white, very pale. And if those conditions um, are left like that for too long, the coral animal can actually die. Um, and this was uh, well documented uh, in the mass bleaching events of 2016, 2017, 2019, um, throughout the Indo-Pacific, as well as um, on the Great Barrier Reef. And we can see here one of those stark images of a very large stand of coral bleached um, and would potentially go on and die in the weeks to come. So what is coral bleaching? So as I mentioned before, um, coral is an animal. It does look like a slimy rock, but it is an animal. And on uh, this part, uh, the kind of golden brown color, that's where, that's a healthy coral tissue. So that's where we have these little dinoflagellate um, symbionts that live inside of corals that give them a majority of the energy they need to survive through photosynthesis. And that's what we want to see on a coral reef, um, a lot of pigmentation, coloration. However, when water temperatures um, become too hot and stay hot for too long, sometimes in conjunction with very high light conditions or very still doldrum conditions, um, we can actually see a breakdown in this symbiosis. And these little dinoflagellate cells, these little brown golden cells actually leave the coral tissue. And what we get is um, the coral tissue is still alive, still intact, but now we can see through it and we can see the skeleton below. So that's when we get that bleaching effect. And then, as I mentioned before, if those conditions persist for too long, or even if the water temperatures um, just become uh, exceedingly high, two degrees, 2.5 degrees, three degrees, we actually get the tissue of the animal fall off the skeleton. And then it's often colonized by filamentous algae. Um, and that's when we start to see that kind of scuzzy, scuzzy look. And that's the, the, the animal, the coral animal is truly dead at that point. And that's often when we start to see a real degradation and breakdown of the reef structure after that. Um, and because of the advent of these mass bleaching events and subsequent mortality events, there has been a lot of emphasis to try to think about new ways to help reefs either recover from this damage through restoration activities or kind of conservation actions that we can do at the moment in order to relieve some of the pressure on reefs so that they have a better chance of persisting if there is um, indeed warming and bleaching. And we've really been trying to consolidate a lot of these documents um, with the kind of management framework. So in particular, how do we take uh, genetic data and translate it into kind of in the water actions that people can start to use optimize, record, um, come together on in order to have more of a concerted uh, global effort around conservation and restoration of coral reefs. 
Um, so uh, interestingly, a lot of the literature that is um, being discussed now in the coral reef world you know, has its place in terrestrial conservation. And a lot of the um, kind of larger uh, spatial scale uh, interventions on coral reefs often require the movement of corals uh, or potential movement of corals from one reef to another reef. And so this kind of um, conservation movement actions have been uh, you know, we can see here in terrest some of the terrestrial world, a rhinoceros being moved to a new location, the kakapo in uh, New Zealand, this is obviously taken probably sometime in the 1970s, um, and more recently being uh, transported in a cat carrier on a flight, um, so to moved around to different uh, pr regions of preservation. And then um, this was from a flight that we did in 2019 to move corals from the north of the Great Bear Reef down to the center of the Great Bear Reef. So a lot of the conservation actions that are currently being considered have to do with some kind of movement. And if we break these down, again, taken from the terrestrial literature, we can really see that um, most of the conservation actions have to do with moving organisms outside of their native ranges. Um, so augmentation en enhancement, substitution, assisted migration is often talked about, um, invented ecosystems, so that's the creation of completely new habitats, potentially without any um, previous context. Um, but for this talk, I will be limiting the con uh, conversation to a technique called assisted gene flow. And this is very much within the range of the known species or the species of interest that we're talking about here. And by um, contextualizing it within the species range, it's thought that we're also able to diminish any kind of risks, especially genetic risks, of some kind of unintended conservation, negative conservation uh, outcome. So for this talk, I will be um, focus mostly on this assisted gene flow. And again, I want to underscore that it's about um, moving the, that organism around its known range. However, I would refer uh, listeners to this, these texts here, which talk about kind of the broader uh, theory behind the movement of organisms both within and outside of their ranges. So assisted gene flow in corals and indeed in many other organisms really is based on the idea of how can we move organisms from one location potentially that is heating up much more quickly if we're talking about global, uh, global climate change and in the context of warming to another location that is cooler um, in order to um, either get that species out of its uh, range of danger or potentially to move that organism there in order to facilitate gene flow and enhancement of gene flow in that location um, in order to prepare that cooler location for potential warming in the future. So it's really about how can we move organisms within its native range in order to buffer against future warming and bleaching events. And the example that I'm going to talk through today um, was performed uh, multiple times on the Great Barrier Reef. So that's the east coast of Australia, where we have a um, very nice temperature gradient where the north of the Great Barrier Reef is on average much warmer compared to the central Great Barrier Reef and very much compared to the southern Great Barrier Reef. So this really, um, potentially opens up the possibility that could we potentially use corals that are from these warmer regions and are locally adapted to warming, uh, warming waters and either move them to cooler areas, again, within their native ranges, historical ranges, or potentially crossbreed them with cooler reefs in order to produce baby corals that have this higher temperature tolerance and that could thereby be moved to cooler regions in order to prepare those cooler regions for warming. So in this coral specific context, it's really about moving corals in anticipation for future warming that we know we're gonna get down the track um, if we don't get our carbon emissions under control. 
So the whole idea of assisted gene flow is to identify uh, regions or produce resilient coral material for movement. So here we have a little coral baby with those symbionts inside that I talked about before. Um, and we've really been trialing these kind of assisted gene flow techniques on the Great Barrier Reef for about the last six years. And we've just started to move into Ningaloo Reef this last year on the west coast of Australia. And so far, we've been able, with selective breeding, to increase the heat tolerance of coral offspring through the selective breeding of both warm with cool parents by about three degrees. So it's very promising, um, but still a lot, a lot to do in order to determine um, feasibility. And so this, what does three degrees translate to? So that's about a 26 time increase in survival when those babies, uh, heat tolerant babies were exposed to temperatures, high temperatures relative to offspring uh, that weren't uh, selectively bred. So again, so we're really starting, <clears throat> excuse me, we're really starting to see that selective breeding and assisted gene flow, at least in the context of warming and in particular coral species, really does have the potential to, at least in the short term, increase heat tolerance um, to future warming conditions. And so genetics, where does genetics play in all of this? So not only does the genetics really lead us to where those heat tolerant corals are in particular biomarkers, but it can also tell us about the mechanisms that underlie the selective breeding that we're performing. So by sequencing both the adult corals as well as the baby corals that have been selectively bred, we're able to compare, for example, the allele frequencies of different groups of corals, for example, um, in purebred heat tolerant corals. So that's where the baby corals have both uh, parents are heat tolerant parents, or we can look at the allele frequency shifts due to selective breeding in hybrid corals. So that's where one of the parent is a heat tolerant coral and the other parent is a non heat tolerant coral. And then we can compare that to um, kind of the standing stock of that reef. So when neither parents uh, came from heat tolerant stock, so that's why it's in blue. And we can start to look at what selective breeding actually does to the genomic architecture um, after one generation, after two generation. You know, we can really look at subsequent breeding trials to really understand what's going on mechanistically when we breed for different traits, and in this case, heat tolerance. And then we're able to look and see where those allele frequency changes are occurring on the genome in order to see if it's happening in locations that we would expect given this trait. And in this case, we did see the canonical kind of heat tolerance uh, chaperone proteins become involved in the breeding. So it really kind of tells us that are we, are we breeding for a process that is repeatable over time? Is it a process that is happening in different parts of the genome with different coral species? So genomics really offers um, a lot of the why to the selective breeding that we do and helps to really inform the targeted nature of this conservation outcome. Um, besides the genomics, we can also look at transcriptomics. So we can start to look at how genes are turned on and off in these different organisms, again, to understand the mechanisms behind breeding for heat tolerance. So this kind of gives us two different snapshots, temporal snapshots, in terms of what assisted gene flow and selective breeding can offer us as a conservation tool. So the um, gene expression seen here can tell us about really rapid changes that these organisms are undergoing when they're exposed to temperature. And these genomic changes can really tell us more about what are the more long-term adaptive changes that these um, different crosses, um, or rather different selectively bred crosses, are undergoing when we do this kind of conservation action. So um, genomics and transcriptomics can really start to tell us about the mechanisms behind the scenes of the genomic and transcriptomic architecture that we're working with. Um, so this really suggests that there is 
potential to future proof at least specific areas of the reef. And we've um, been able to outplant or put, uh, put things out into the ocean, um, outplant these baby corals to see how they'll do uh, in the wild. So obviously when we create these little baby corals in the lab, they're undergoing a lot of selective pressures that are lab focused. So that is um, things that are essentially going to shape their survival, but for conditions that are in the lab. But obviously, if we're thinking about rewilding particular areas, we really need to think about the selective pressures that are occurring in the field. So we were able to see what does survivorship look like in the field? What does growth look like in, this, in the field? What does um, photosynthesis look like in the field? Uh, what does the symbiotic relationship look like in the field? So these are really questions that are starting to get at, um, you know, translating results from the lab into the field because we know uh, conservation actions change, the potential for conservation action changes for when, uh, when organisms are actually released into their habitat um, of preference. So we've been working on this again for the last few years, and we've really been starting to see um, trade-offs between different traits, as well as um, how timing makes a big difference in terms of survival and the transference of heat tolerance um, when put out into the wild. So I guess all this is to say is that whatever results you do get in the lab, they really need to be ground-truthed um, in that habitat where that conservation action is intended to take place because the ultimate results of those actions could vary uh, depending on selective pressures. And so it's really important also to, I guess, contextualize the success of selective breeding and assisted gene flow with all the questions that we have so far not been able to answer because this is an emerging space. Um, so for, uh, for example, the risks are still largely unquantified. We've been able to show that deployment success and the success of the conservation action largely depends on when these organisms are put uh, into the wild. Uh, in particular, is it during a neutral year, a year without warming, or is it during a warming uh, ENSO event? So, you know, that really contextualizes uh, the ability of these organisms to survive and go on to uh, spread the spread the genes throughout the gene pool in that reef of reef or reefs of choice. Um, we don't yet have a good enough handle on the capacity to swamp the existing gene pool. So we really need to do um, more work on trying to understand when we put these selectively bred uh, organisms out into the field, what is their capacity to outcompete both in the physiological sense, as well as the gene flow sense, the stock that is already there. Um, because obviously we need to, the, the number one uh, thing that we need to think about is doing no unintended harm. So we really need to get a better handle on this capacity to swamp the existing gene pool. And thus far, this kind of conservation action uh, is particularly expensive and a small footprint. So the scale of the conservation intervention really needs to be taken into account relative to uh, the, the conservation cost. And there is still a lot of ethical and sociocultural concerns that need to be addressed when considering the movement of organisms um, across sea country. So uh, that needs to be looked at in terms of uh, First Nation concerns with moving corals around and the production of offspring of different lineages. Um, and all that to say that the regulatory mechanisms for these kind of conservation actions are still being developed. Thankfully, we can again turn to the terrestrial folks and the terrestrial um, regulatory practices to really take a lead here. Um, but certain rules are different in the marine space and they should be um, contextualized specifically for the for the marine space. So um, that regulatory space is, is very active and still being developed. Um, and, you know, more than anything, uh, new, new results and new questions come out every, every day, every year. Uh, so watch this space.
So with that, I would just like to say thank you um, and remind listeners that there are multiple modules um, and to continue on to the next module. And would like to uh, say thank you to all the TSI contributors that helped to um, make this module, these modules happen.